Phil beat you at the ball. Like, just because you're playing Phil. And Michael is the same, but the only thing Michael knows about me and I know about Michael, I'm not scared of him. And he knows I'm not scared of him. Danny Knopper, Danny will destroy my career though. Losing that match in the UK Open. If I want to learn to play darts, I don't go to the BDO, I go straight to the BDC. I, I learned that way. It either kills me or it makes me. And for years, it, it was killing me. Well, what was it like growing up where some of your peers, I'd imagine some of you, your mates, they are now either banged up or some of them aren't even around. I was staying in and not doing what I should be doing. But most of them are in jail now. And I'm sat here doing an interview as world champions. Every time you break a bone, something <laughs> incredible happens in the world of darts. Yeah, well, that was Christmas Eve, that, 2009. Slip Showing off being an idiot again? No, no, no. Ah, slipping. No, Christmas Eve, too many cans. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see what it would be like to do a podcast while also throwing chocolate. Uh, you can eat it. But don't <laughs> Hello and welcome to another special episode of The Dart Show. Your chance to hear from the characters and the icons of this game in a little bit more depth than just the usual rubbish post-match two-minute interview. <laughs> I'm delighted to say that we are joined by the man who is right now top of the world rankings and the reigning world champion. It is Michael Smith, the bully boy. Michael, thank you very much for talking You're to welcome. us. It's an early start for you today, isn't it? Yeah, it's not the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's a knackered boy. Nah, it's all right. Bless your heart. Thank you very much for joining us anyway. Right, um, let's. we're going to talk about everything here. So we're going to go right back to the root of this. Tell me about you and St. Helens. Don't look at me blank. <laughs> Don't look at me blank. Uh, no, it's just just trying to think so much. No, it's not really. uh, no, I just remember being a kid and just going watching the matches down at Nosley Road. And then, yeah, we ended up moving from the stadium, going to the new one now. And every now and again, I get a chance to go. Especially once we moved to that stadium, I started playing darts as well. So time doesn't allow me to see every match. But yeah, it is good because like when I've got time off, I take the kids down, the missus comes with me as well, stand behind the sticks. Yeah, it's just St. Helens in a hole. It's just it's where I belong. See, so you, you have gone straight for the rugby league team there. I was on about the town and how important it is to you because you were born and raised there and have, have never left and probably never going to, right? Yeah, um, I think if you speak to anyone in St. Helens, it goes straight to the rugby team. There's only two things in Saints. It was rugby or it's the glass. <laughs> Pilkerson's glass. So that's the only two things we were famous for. But I think the boys playing darts from Saints and now we're starting to add our name into the mix as well. What was it like growing up there? Because, look, St. Helens, as you say, it, it's rugby league, it's glass, and it's nowadays a little bit <laughs> of darts. But, I mean, it's not... It's not a glamorous place to grow up. It's not. It's not. You know, it's hit by poverty and all sorts of stuff. It was. It's a tough place to grow up, isn't it? Yeah, as from an outsider, let yourself look in, and you'd think a bit rough that. <laughs> so the, living there, like I grew up in Cherry Tree Drive, which wasn't one of the best places. But me and all the boys would go out play Manhunt or hide and see Kirby football, anything you name it. And Are we good at Kirby? No. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, our days used to consist of. Listen, watching the police wave vans go straight past the houses, straight to the top, there was like a little triangle at the top of our street. And next, every other day, this house was being raided every single day. That was our fun, just watching this house being raided every single day. But yeah, once Steve got evicted and moved out, the street kind of come boring then. You had nothing to watch. <laughs> so you had to make your own fun up then. I mean, everybody, everybody's look well aware. Areas where there's poverty, there's there's lots of other associated problems, you know, the lack of jobs, um, crime, drugs, all this stuff. Is it fair to say that there's plenty of people you grow up with who've gone down that route? And were it not for you making something of your life in professional sport, there's a chance that could happen to you? Yeah, 13, 14 when I started playing, I just made a sacrifice where I stayed in every single day to play the arts practice. You get called like boring or I don't want to swear but yeah that uh, I was staying in and not doing what I should be doing but most of them are in jail now and I'm sat here doing an interview as world champion so I think I made the correct decision to stay in and yeah my life could be totally different now and yeah I'm just thankful for the sport and my dedication to it which changed. Well, what was it like growing up where some of your peers I'd imagine some of you, your mates 
they are now either banged up or some of them aren't even around. Yeah, I've had, I've had a few who's uh, sadly took their own lives as well through stuff like that and uh, it's, it is bad. Yeah, you got some who's in jail now. I've got some family members who's there as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not the best, but it's where you're from. That's why I love it so much. It's if Like I said before, if you're an outsider looking in, it's not the best place to look at. But if you're from there, you, you can't leave. It's It just always keeps you there. Well, yeah, you've made the choice to stay there. I mean, are you in... What are you? Is it your second house you've moved into in St. Hans? You had one and you bought one and then you moved into another one? Yeah, we had saw my mum's house. We had our own and then I moved into a third and my mum moved into mine. So we kind of just separated around in St. Helens. But yeah, I, I'd, I'd say I'd love to move because it's not, I don't want my kids growing up there because I know what it's like. But my kids still go to the same school I went to and then they'll go to the same high school I went to as well. So. It didn't do me any harm. I know I'm thick as... It, it didn't do me any harm. My kids are top of the classes. They're clever. I make sure they do all the work all the time. And yeah, it is good for them. Great stuff. Um, let's talk about jobs. Because I know there was a... You were trained as a joiner, weren't you? Yeah. And you sacked it off <laughs> to go and play in a darts competition. Uh, we're just on your... Was it a final like test or exam or something? Yeah, final exam left to be qualified. And then I would have gone out working to... Um, what was that called? Doing like your MVQs and stuff. Mm. Again, you, I would have been doing all that then. But yeah, my PC is dead. Got smashed off Phil Taylor. I think it was like second round or something. So <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the best. It, it wasn't a wise decision to make. Well, in the long run, it managed to work out. Then I just had to put the extra work in because I'd blew my safety net of getting a getting a real job. So yeah, once I blew that, I had to make this work, and I just put the extra hour in. I was only doing three, four, five hours a day. I put the extra hour in each day, and yeah, it helped out. It worked. Well, I'm I'm going to get to your dedication and your practice and how you have turned yourself into the player you are. But staying on the theme of jobs. Let's talk about the nickname because I know you've told this story a million times, but it's worth it, isn't it? You work, was it was it a farm or was it like an abattoir? What was uh, you working at? When I was a uh, when I was a kid, I'd, like every school holidays, you'd have two weeks off or uh, six weeks off. All that. I used to go down to Littleborough where my two aunties had pubs, mm. so I could I could stay at the top of the pub. And then the the security guy Chris, he used to have his own farm, like a, a meat farm. And just working on that, and yeah. Uh, what was, were you doing on this farm? Oh, it was just just shoveling. Uh, yeah, just shoveling, oh. muck around and everything. But one day we was letting. What was we doing? We was tagging the calves, yeah. so we had to put the identification numbers with the parents, so you you know which one. What in their ears? Yeah, so you had to give them a little like, earpiece in. And one of them, it was only three days old. He forgot the tag, so he forgot the wrong tag, and uh, I had to grab it. I was holding on to it anyway. I'd be back in a minute. It wasn't. It's was about thirty minutes. <laughs> when he when he come back, I was covered in muck. I was on my back with my fingers in his nose, legs up in the air, <laughs> and he just called me a bully. And he just that was before he even started playing darts. So when I was looking for a name, like he just always come back to that because I was picking some dreadful names. Like, <laughs> so, so he just come back from that, and then it, I, it was bully at one spell. And then when I made a Twitter account, I just put bully boy, and he just stuck. I'm, I'm genuinely. How, how old was this calf? About three, four days old. Three, four days. You see, that's still quite a big thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Like wrestling that for half an hour. <laughs> it's, it's it's mad because you think three, four days it, it shouldn't shouldn't be that strong, but it was. Especially I was only what thirteen at the time, anyway. And uh, yeah, I think was it Chris's dad as well was trying to get the calf away from his mum, and it it kind of. Like, like a horse doesn't it bucks backwards yeah, yeah. but he did die into his knee and it knocked him clean like in, I, I giggled and I shouldn't have done like it's, make, <laughs> it's making me laugh now but like his knee went like a balloon and he was on the floor and like I, when we got into the crush like where you lock its head in so yeah. you can do whatever you would need to do when we got into that he literally just grabbed its head and he, he was that angry man Chris he just grabbed its head and it turned in you could see the cow like just twisting because he, I thought he was going to snap his neck uh, he just gave up at the end because he wasn't going to win that fight. That's, but his knee was bad. Yeah, that sounds a horrendous. <laughs> Did you quite like doing that job? Yeah, of course. He's, that was that's why. Like now, I have my own farm, but I'd, I just need me bull now. But just growing up, I just always loved working with animals. Apart from being joining in school, I wanted to be a vet. I just didn't want to do the extra seven to ten years <laughs> after I'd left school to do it. So I was never good at writing or 
listening and learning. I think you've known me now for what, how many years? You know I'm not very good at listening. <laughs> not very good at timekeeping either, so it, it wasn't something for me. Yeah, you're only five minutes late today, fair play. <laughs> um, do you think that's what you would have done? Do you think you'd be working with animals? Whether it be like, you could have been a zookeeper for or something, or a, a f- working on a farm. That's what you probably would have ended up doing if it weren't for darts? Yeah, of course. I'd do it now. Like, if I've got darts there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if I could work at, say, like, Nosley Safari or Chester Zoo, Tuesday, Wednesday, just as helping out, I'd go and do it. It's just something I love to do. I love being around different types of animals. And it's just something that just, it keeps me sane, it keeps me happy doing stuff like that. Great stuff. Um, we talked about one injury there for your mate who got a busted knee, but your career, it seems, coincides with some weird injuries. Yeah. I mean, you only started playing because you broke your hip. Right? Yeah. So you broke your hip at age early I would, teens? Was I, it? I would have been year 10 at school. Year nine, yeah, year 10. Yeah, so I would have been 14, 14 15. Broke your hip. Was that playing sport or was that No, I was just over? being an idiot showing off in front of my mates. Like wheeling my bike, wheeled it too much and it fell off and yeah, my hip just jarred up my side. Couldn't walk for ten to twelve weeks. And it was just watching my dad practice in the house. I had no interest in it whatsoever. And obviously I couldn't move. I was like, No, I just give it a go. I've got nothing else to do. So I started having a practice and yeah, my first one eighty after about four weeks, five weeks on the crutches. Once I could walk properly, it took me to a darts tournament, a youth one. I've still got the envelope in my safe, I think. When I was about 15, winning it, it was £100 for the winner. Did drop a leg. It's like, no, I could make money from this and I'm still in school. So, so it's that, it was that quick where you went, actually, I'm, I'm good. Mm. Mind you, your dad would have recognised you. Yeah, my, yeah, mum and dad used to have like seven jobs. Where I know we had the pub, but his mum like took loads of extra side jobs just to send me around the UK playing. That was when I was 17, no, 18, 17. So early on, my dad used to take me to the tournaments, started winning a couple, and that's when they took on the extra jobs just to send me to Bristol. <laughs> he was just playing Shropshire, he was playing stuff like that, just playing the UK regionals. And then I think Gary took over then, and that's when I could travel the world, which was even better for me. It's quite a sacrifice they've made to help you go and do this, isn't it? Yeah, that's why my dad works with me now. So my dad gets a wage for me just for driving and just being here so it's always about giving back to them as well and I think I've, I've mentioned it in the past when I win I've always said it's not only me it's we all win my family everything I've always looked after my family so when you're growing up and you're getting good you quite quickly think I could <coughs> this could be something I could make some money out of this but are you at that point are you thinking professional and PDC and everything or are you just thinking there's tournaments out there where I can go and play in opens and win four or five hundred quid and I can have some money coming. I never I never thought about the PDC because it would have been uh what would it have been? Two thousand and seven. Yeah, seven. I think when Gary played um Weber in the IDL. Mm. That was the first darts match I ever watched. So I never knew about that till yeah. it was until two thousand and eight. Well, seven. Eight, I think did I make my debut in the UK, I think. You could open or nine, one of them. It would have been about then. Yeah. So yeah, it was only from that match watching. I was like, no, I, I think I think I could do that. Like, why not give it a go? If I learn to swim, I jump in at six foot. If I want to learn to play darts, I don't go to the BDO. I go straight to the PDC. I, I learn that way. Either kills me or it makes me. And for years, it, it was killing me, killing my parents with the jobs, trying to send me everywhere. And then, like I said before, once I got a chance to go abroad, it meant. I didn't have to, my mum and dad didn't have to sacrifice because someone else was sending me there. They went straight back down to the one job with the pub and I just got to do what I would love to do. I mean, you mentioned it briefly there, Gary. Gary Anderson, you then start up a (coughs) relationship with him and he gives you that chance to to give this a proper go. What's it like? And realise you weren't, it's probably your dad who was more excited about it. I'd imagine Gary Anderson yeah. getting in touch than you. You were like, Gary who? No, oh, it's good. Gary, Gary was my like my idol because he, he was the first game I ever watched. So oh, right, okay. I started playing, not playing. I, I wanted to go to the PDC because of him. But just I just loved the way he played with his little stupid earring he had as well <laughs> back in the day. So, yeah, it was, it was one of them. I just wanted to be like him. He was the big scorer, rubbish at doubles. Pretty like my game at the minute. <laughs> but then, yeah, he turned everything around and, he, and look what he has done now. So, well, What was that like then? Because it's one thing thinking, oh, I'm, I'm quite good. I, can, I could make this work for me. 
But if you're getting a genuine icon of the game come up to you and go, you you are good. I can I can help make you a star of this game. What's that feel like? Yeah, I th- it was it was weird because it was me and Adam Hunt at the same time. We signed at the same time. And I think he said the same. It was like his idol. We just jumped at the chance. Whereas <clears throat> Adam had already won a youth and I think I'd already won a PDC title at the time. Mm-hmm. I'd already won in Barnsley in 2010. 10, 9, 10. So it was it was kind of flipped for me though. I want to because I've I've just got six grand from winning the pro tour that could send me a lot of places because at the time I think it was only sixty five pounds to enter or fifty pounds to enter. I thought that could send me a lot of places to play if I don't waste the money and be stupid. And I was like, you know what? If he if he's willing to do this, I can save that. And it kind of split it then. So I just jumped to the title the first title you won the senior one 2010 that came after another ridiculous injury didn't it where you'd broken your wrist yeah I broke both my hands <laughs> i mean like every time you break a bone something <laughs> incredible happens in the world of darts isn't it yeah well, that was christmas eve uh, 2009 Slip- showing off being an idiot again no, or just slipping this time uh, slipping no, christmas eve too many cans <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah i'd had a few many a few many two drinks with my mates like in the house parties and stuff and just walking home, it was icing. As I've slipped, my knees hit the floor. I've got back up, slipped again. But as I put my hands down, my hands have gone like underneath me, so they just bent both of them. Yeah. yeah. So, but it wouldn't like at the time. It was. It, I'd say I want to make a time. It was like nine, ten o'clock at night. So I didn't really know because I was that intoxicated. Yeah. <laughs> so it was when my mate woke me up at I think like seven o'clock. Said, "Mate, my mum, dad, that's gonna come down now with the kids." You and of course, I said, yeah, no, no worries, I'll go home anyway. So I tried to put my coat up, I was like, how do I get out my coat? Like, I couldn't literally physically pick my coat up. I went home and said, Mum, I'm knackered. <laughs> she said, what do you mean? I said, I can't move my hands. She looked at me and she went, they're not, they're not black, they're not blue or whatever. You'd be fine. I said, no, literally, I cannot move my hands. All right, we'll go to Whiston. When there, they went, oh, it's Christmas Day, you'll be fine. You've been in and out by two hours. Yeah, about eight hours later, come out with pot on this hand and then they went we'll put the fracture one on this so you're not completely like yeah. immobile type thing no he's got home realised my mum got me a car for Christmas and an Xbox so I couldn't do anything I couldn't <laughs> drive I couldn't drive I couldn't play on the Xbox nothing <laughs> just got one night of drinking <laughs> that's <laughs> amazing I mean look there's Plenty of people, God knows I've done it, woken up on Christmas Day with a hangover, but never so hungover that I can't use my <laughs> hands and don't know how to do it. That is a nightmare as well. What did you do with the Xbox? Just sit there and look I at just it left because I, I was like, I always wanted a break as well from darts. So I was like, you know what, I'll put my darts in the wardrobe. I can't play for eight weeks. It'd be fine. But after two weeks, I was like, I want to practice. So I got some scissors. And I cut, like, because it was up to my fingers, I cut down to my knuckles here and around here so I could actually grab the thing. I think that's why it took longer for my hands to heal because I started playing darts through it. I just had to, like, flick it instead of throwing normal. Mm. But once I cut that, I could actually play on the Xbox then. I could drive the, <laughs> I could drive the car as well, even though I shouldn't. So no, I, once I moved it down lower, I could start playing then. Um, and you won not long after that. You won your first PDC title, didn't you? So that's the the first one you picked up. That's got to be that's got to be a watershed moment. There'll be big moments in your career you look back on. I'd imagine that's it, one of them. It was that day because I'd never been past uh, the last sixteen, and I was five 0 down to Robert Thornton, and I managed to come back and win six five to make the quarters. And I was like, that was just a big day in itself that I'd finally got to a quarter final of a, a ranking event. And then I think I played Vincent van der Voort. I think I won that six two. Beat Whitlock six two and beat Chizzy and then Chizzy was five, five all. He had I went tops left at twenty ten. Did a Richie Burnett on double five, like literally nearly fell over, and luckily <laughs> enough it went in. Uh, so it, it was just meant to be that day, I guess. Well, that must have been a weird one because obviously Chizzy from the same sort of area. I mean, you'd grown up playing in local league stuff alongside Chizzy and was Bunting. Uh, no, I, Matt, yeah, no. But Bunting, yeah, Bunting would have been Saints then. So he'd, he'd not long moved into St. Helens then. But in like my team growing up, in, there was me, Chiz, Eddie Dutson, mm-hmm. and a few other boys like Bry, Teabag, and all them. So we all. Teabag? <laughs> it's, not because, called teabag? it's not because of that. I don't know why they call him that. But <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we all. That, that was our dad team, which we'd always win the league and stuff. As you can imagine, we're having Eddie and Chizzy in the team. 
But yeah, it was good. So I used to practice with Chiz every now and again. But on a Thursday night, Friday night, so it was like Thursdays 501, Fridays 301 double start. That was my practice every night then, just with them two. Because we'd always stay behind. I'd probably go in school stinking of it, stinking of ill. So, <laughs> yeah. So I used to practice with them on, on a Thursday and Friday night, staying to about 12, 1 o'clock, go home, get a telling off by my mum. And say, you still going to school in the morning? I'm like, bet you I'm not. And she made sure I did. <laughs> so, that's how I was tired, just being with them. Um, That check you got there, six grand, and obviously you've already explained, like, Gary... <laughs> you've got a sort of management deal where they're going to cover some of your expenses and travel. So for the first time, you're coming back home and you've got a bit of money in your pocket. As a young man, is it difficult to stop that going to your head? Uh, it did a bit. I remember I went straight out and bought a... What car was it? Uh, an MG ZR Green. It was... It was banger. It was bad. But I thought I was good... I only paid like something like 2200 for it. As you can see, it was not very good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just I bought that straight away money. I thought that'll do me because I can drive to the events now myself. I don't have to rely on someone for a lift. Started doing that and then, yeah, it's just the money then. A few times I had a gamble or whatever, like your football bets. And obviously you couldn't do it on your phone back then. It just went stupid. It was kind of from being in college, getting thirty quid a week, and learning to survive on thirty quid a week, to getting six grand in virtually a day. Mm. What we do is buy some clothes, a few football beds, bought the car, and I'm literally within three or four days, it was gone. Yeah, it's a dangerous game, isn't it? <coughs> because you you always just you have your great day or great month or whatever, and then naturally. Sports people just think, well, that's going to carry on because I'm at this level. I'm not going to get any worse. And but sports not like that. It's, it, there's ups and downs, isn't it? Yeah. What's worse in school? They don't teach you of finances of like tax or doing your books or doing whatever. They don't teach you that. So when I got that money, I'm like tax man. Forget about him. <laughs> it's only one year. It will wait a lot. I'd straight away I spent all the money and I was like instead of taking twenty percent now and putting it to one side. I know it wasn't much, it would have been 1,200 quid just after six grand for tax. Yeah, but it's a lot then. Yeah, a lot back then, especially I was only 19, well, 20 years old. So I was still fresh out of college, really. When I was in college, so I was 19, so it, it was it was different. I think I think back to when I was 19, if somebody had given me a cheque for £6,000, <laughs> I think that should be illegal, because I don't think I could be trusted <sighs> to... To behave responsibly with it. I, I still don't think I'm trusted with it. <laughs> it's just, I just, I, I'm a lot more clever now with it, but I'm still not trusted with it. Okay. Um, the next big moment, career wise, probably the World Youth Championship, isn't it? I mean, by this point, you're established on the PDC tour, you are traveling all around the place, you, you're sort of getting, getting into the PDC lifestyle, but you're not regularly playing in big TV tournaments and, and winning games on the telly. You're just sort of establishing yourself. But the World Youth Championship was a big thing, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I didn't ever qualify for so the UK and the Worlds. That was a... But so the Youth Worlds, it was my last year. So I was like, I've got to win this. There's no way I've got to win if you want. It's the last big chance you've got. Yeah, and I went through that, I think, and he lost... Uh, lost two legs, I think, on the day. That was to Adam Hunt. Every other game was 6-0, beat him 6-2. And then I lost one, oh no, I only lost one leg, I think. One to him or two, and then I lost one to Ricky at the final. Because that was when Michael won his first uh, Premier League against Phil. Mm. With a 1-3-2 over the O2. And I won just before that. And as you can see, I was still young then and stupid. And I got 10 run for that and I didn't know how to keep all that either. <laughs> Why, where did that money go? <clears throat> what did I do with that money? Um, I remember I bought more clothes. Because I was like upgrading each time instead of looking like a tramp, I started going a bit better each time. I know like, what else did I go? What What was the natural progression then? Was it Was it Matalan Adidas? Oh, I don't even Hugo know. Hugo Boss. Is that oh, steps? You, you go Boss, and it just come now. <laughs> um, <laughs> bench, I think it was. Bench. Remember yeah. Bench? And I what, think I think I remember you wearing a load of Bench top. Yeah, back it, in remember the on Dars um, Davis? It's still I think it's still there. Uh, mm. Me in a pink Bench top when I beat Chizzy in the final. <laughs> that was my first pro tour. Uh, what, else, what else was there? And some random clothes, and yeah, probably a few more gambling. I think by then I could play on my phone as well, which was worse. Yeah. Did, did do you ever feel 
like it was an issue for you? I mean, obviously, you spent more than you wanted to, and there's times where you go, I shouldn't, shouldn't. But do you think there was, do you think it could have become an issue for you? No, because I never chased her. Once I lost it, I lost it. I never chased it, so it wasn't, I don't think I was addicted to her. I just, I just enjoyed trying to win more money, but I was losing money. money. It's one of them I was young, stupid, and it could have ruined, ruined my career because I could have like literally done everything there. I had no money to travel for the next so many tournaments, but luckily enough, I had my parents to rely on if I needed that. However, the O2 itself, <coughs> aside from the fact that you just shucked 10K against <laughs> the wall in a short period of time, it was 10K fans in there as well. That, that was a new experience for you and, and probably one I'd imagine you can still remember now. Yeah, I remember being there because I had all my family as well. And I lost the first leg. I think Ricky went out in 15, I think, the first leg. But I was like, I'll show you how I'll do it. It's fine, it's fine. I'll get you running a winner. And I think my first leg, I checked 91 on the bull to make it one all. And then that's a blur then. And I just remember the double two at the end to winner with my stupid, I had proper bad hair back then. It's not the best day now. But I remember walking out and someone like ruffled my head. So when I was playing, like I had like little spikes sticking out this way. And it proper does me every time I see that picture, it does me head in. Like, especially how round it was as well. And then I got me hair like this. I was like, oh, I'm so glad I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> right, Michael, let's talk about the business end of your career where you started to evolve into the player you are now. Uh, and because I am who I am, uh, I always think of the Euro Tour. Um, I think that's where you started to really prove you could be a winner. But the breakthrough game was probably beating Phil Taylor at the Worlds, wasn't it? Yeah, 2013. I'd never won at the Worlds before. I think I'd lost to Stompy and Barna. Yeah, those are my first two years. Yeah. And then I played Hashimoto in the first round. Managed to win that with like a seven yard average. Struggle like mine. I had Phil. It was like playing Phil Taylor. Yeah, you, you won uh, twelve to one or fourteen to one to uh, to win. Yeah, he, so, was, he was fifty to one yeah. on. And the I remember that night. The only person who was going around saying I think Michael Smith can win was Gary, and yeah. he was telling everybody. I told my dad. I said, "Give me the first set." I said, I probably won't win it because I'll be thinking of him playing. I said, so look, give me that first set. I'll um, end up losing that 3-0, the set. But I said, give me that first set, and then after that, I'll show you. Then I'll find it. I'll find my feet. I did. I lost the first set 3-0, and I come straight back out. I checked like a 1-4-1, one, one, a 1-2-1. One, one. And I started to find my feet then. I think, did he have something stupid like 38 or 39, 140s? With a 180, it was something ridiculous with my scoring. was It was always in, and yeah, it ended up going to a deciding set. And obviously I didn't see it at the time, but I've seen it when his back, he turns around, so it might have been Bob, his mate in the crowd going, watch this. But then I went out in 13 and four, or 12 and 13, and two legs in the in the shootout. And I was like, I think, I think I've made it. Am I going to be on the front pages of the paper now for a couple of days, maybe a week, and I'll have all these interviews. I can get, finally get my name out there. And then, yeah, I think <clears throat> the game after against Peter Wright, where I could have won that game, and that was the year he made the final. Because I think one leg where I had to go free, I don't know, I think it was free to up. Or something, but I had a uh, treble twin and treble twin uh, through, and we died at the 20, but not the ball trebled out. And I still managed to get a shot in that leg to win the set as well. So if they would have stayed in, I could have won, but it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't, but that... That victory over Phil Taylor, and then over the next couple of years, you picked up a couple of Euro Tour titles, beating Van Gerwen in the final of both of them. This is you turning into a top-level player. Because after that spell of, you know, you hadn't won at the Worlds, you'd only been appearing at the UK Open and, and the World Championship. Now things are starting to come together for you as a player. Can you remember what it felt like getting better, getting further, taking these new steps and having these moments like beating Phil or, or winning a, a first stage title. Yeah, I just remember being, I think it was single, single Fegan, single Fegan, well, however you say it. And I had a dad to beat Merv King in the final. He beat me 6-5 in the European Tour. Come back and then we had Crawler. That was a Sunday. Michael beat me 6-5 in the final. So it was like, for me, that was back-to-back -back finals, which I'd never done. And then the week after, wherever I can't remember who it was, I managed to beat Michael in the final of the European Tour. And I was like, I'm starting to play really good here, but that's what got to me again. When I won that, I was like, 
I've made it now. I've done three finals on a spin, won one of them. I've made it. Start getting lazy again, just playing on my computer. And yeah, just went downhill again. Cause that's, you could see a pattern coming through my career where I'd win a tournament early on. It was normally in Wigan, one of the UK Open qualifiers, mm. or then it'd be European tour. And then I'd disappear until maybe the world. And then I'd make the last 16. And the year after, I'd win one early on, disappear. And it, that's every time I won one, I thought I'd made it. I was like, yeah, good, good. But then when obviously Junior was born, I couldn't do that anymore. I had to practice even harder. The day before he was born, I switched the Xbox off for the last time. I never turned it on ever again. And I just put in the hours I was wasting sat on playing COD or FIFA. I put it onto the dartboard, what I should have done early on. Well, you live and learn. So you, you, that's very easily identifiable for you. You had your first kid, Junior. <coughs> And it was like this is this has got to be serious. I've got to approach this properly. Yeah, because I could be when it was just me. I could be selfish. Where if I had no money, I didn't have no one else to feed. It was just myself. I go to my I'd go to my mum and dad. Then that was still a job in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I was winning tournaments, I was like, I'm your son. I'm your baby. Feed me. <laughs> but no, um, yeah. So obviously, when I had junior, it was ten and four. We got our first house. We had to move out. Obviously, my mum's house wasn't big enough for everyone. And yeah, he was like, I've, I've now got a mortgage, I've got a missus, I've got a kid, I've got, I'm going to have to pull my finger up now. I've got to do something, I've got to work as much as I can. And yeah, as I said, the day before he was born, it was the last day I played the Xbox. And things just took out, even then the apartment was still emerging, I'd only win one a year. But instead of disappearing, I was making quarters, semis, quarters, semis. And I think the first year he was born, I jumped into the 32. That was 2014, and I stayed. I've never ever felt the 32. Mm. I think 20, is it 2017, 20, I, think I jumped into the top 16, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I got to number four within 2018 or 2019. And I've been there ever since without even winning the title because I've only won one. So, like, Grand Slam and World's just gone. So, I'd always been in the top four without winning anything, but it just showed the consistency I was doing with my work I was doing. Making semis, quarters, finals, winning European tours, winning pro tours, and yeah. It's quite you, you've you've said a lot there, and you've used the word lazy a couple of times. Now that's not in in darts terms. That's not a word I'd associate with you because you are a person who puts a lot of practice in. I have for the last eight years, nine years. So you you weren't always like that. No, I was. Um, my mum and dad used to have to give me a kick up. Kick up the backside to get on the board. When my practice was like when my mates were in bed after we played FIFA or played COD, it was like 12 to 3 in the morning when my mum would go mad because it was just banging on the wall when I was throwing. So it was like I'd maybe get an hour in. <clears throat> and yeah, when we moved out, I still didn't have a dartboard. I still wouldn't put a dartboard in the house because I remember it used to annoy my mum and dad. So I wasn't going to annoy my missus or wait, potentially wait, uh, Junior up. So I used to have to go out and practice then where that's when it clicked. Me going out to the pub to practice, another pub was shut, it was like it was mum and dad's place. Me going there to practice was me leaving the house to go to work. Mm. I couldn't, <clears throat> if you had a normal job, I couldn't just go out, do an hour and come back home, you wouldn't get paid. So for me, I had to go out and do a set certain hours. I'd have my break, I'd have my dinner, I'd have another break and then I was done then. I think that's where it's, even now, I still don't have a board at the house, I still go to the pub. And it's just my way of thinking is my job, is my work. Because I always bring up something Gary Anderson, <coughs> Gary Anderson said to me. He said, look, people talk about Michael Smith being this incredibly naturally talented darts player. It's a load of rubbish. The bloke spends hours and hours yeah. and hours and hours and hours on the board practicing. That's not natural talent. The bloke works. It works hard. And you can take that as a compliment or you can take it as a sort of backhanded compliment. Because, I mean, is it, is it natural talent? Or is it the fact that you've grafted to become the player you are? Um, I've grafted, and also there's times where, so like now since the World Championships, I've not practiced at all. I've not, I've not even put a single dart in practice. And we're now the second week in Feb, where normally I would be putting on average 20, 24, 25 hours in a week, 26 hours, three, four, five hours a day. Well, it works out, and then, because I've not had time to do it, but I'm still, like, even last week against Michael, well, I still had 100 average, so it's it's not something I need to work on. I just like to work on it. It, it makes me, I think, 
my throwing style is natural. The, thing, the only thing that's not natural is inside my head. So if I'm going up to play, I think, I've not thrown a dart for six days, seven days. I'm not going to play well here. The minute I think that I'm knackered, well, that's when I will play bad. Mm. So I think that's the only thing that I like to work on mainly. It's just me thinking. Because I've put an hour in a day or two hours in a day. I have practiced and it works. Yeah. Well, the, you, the reason <coughs> that you've not been able to do your usual routine of getting down to the pub and doing your practice every morning is because now where you are in the world of darts and have been for a number of years at the very top, you're in everything. You're traveling everywhere. You're, we've had World Series events straight after the World yeah. Championship. The Premier League, of course. How do you deal with the lifestyle? Because... I know you're not working down a mine. <laughs> I know that you're not working on an oil rig and away for months at a time. There are harder jobs to do than be a professional darts player. It's not an easy one, travelling and being away a lot, is it? Nah, physically it's not hard. I think mentally it is. You look at Gez. Gez is one of the fittest players you could ever think of. Even he gets tired all the time. Ask, he says he's tired, physically tired. And I think it's more mentally what he's doing. It is draining, spending five days a week away, especially when the Premier League's on. So you're spending five days a week away from your family. You either playing in Barnes and then travelling to Germany, or you're playing in Glasgow, which will be next week, going straight to Barnsley. We'll play somewhere, go straight to Germany. And then, like you said before, it's draft of the world. I had a day to up, well, didn't even have a day I press the day after. The day after that I went to Germany to do Prozeban. The day after that I flew straight to Bahrain to play a tournament. So every single time you've got something to do. And it I think it's more draining for your family as well, because they don't get to see you. So, but luckily enough, you do have FaceTime, you have Skype, well, not Skype, what's it called? Zoom. Yeah, Zoom if you need it, like that, especially if you're with the kids on the iPad. It is good. I mean, it's, it is a difficult <coughs> one to, to manage all these things. And because that's the thing, you can oh, grin, grin and bear it. It's not ideal, but carry on. But then you've got to perform at your best while doing it. You can't just go and phone in a day of work like... Some, you know, jobs I've had in the past um, because if you do you end up losing yeah, you and don't, that you don't means know. you're not going to get paid as much as you should yeah it, it, that's why I think this year now it's got, I'm going to pick and choose I'm going to play as much as it's all as I can but were <clears throat> in the past I've, I've tried to play everything and I've burned myself out straight away and yeah, I think you see the, a pattern again from it's always like September, October I'm really really bad like I'm being so poor because I know the Grand Prix coming up that tournament gets written off my calendar every year. <laughs> it's just so, I don't like it. Yeah, I, I, you're going to win that one, Dan, <clears> and you'll love it. But I, just can't, I just can't win there. So I, that gets written off my calendar, and that pattern emerges every year. And that's where, I think, once I've finished from Australia and stuff, that's where I should really go on all day from September and just have two weeks recharging. But September, you've got four Europeans all straight away. You've got the, what is it, the World Series finals as well. So you have no time off. So this year I'm going to pick and choose a few just to even have a weekend in Butland somewhere or go go abroad with the kids. It's, I'm going to try and choose and keep keep charged as much as I can. Do you enjoy the old cultural experiences going different places or have you just has it just grown tiresome? No, I still love it. There's places where I love to go. So I like Prague, I like Budapest. Some places in Germany I do like, some I don't. Especially the two fighters I don't like. <laughs> the two <laughs> fighters. Yeah. The Reeses. And yeah. To be fair, you used to be great. That's where East Germany. That's where you used to win everything. I know, but some of them. But that's when we had shuttles as well. So you used to get picked up and drove to them. Now you've got to find your own way. I, I'm str I still struggle to read English. Reading German isn't good <laughs> for me. So, uh, yeah, the two fighters I don't like. But this German, the German fans are amazing. It's just some of the places they end. Down <laughs> with foreign food? Uh, no, but not, the thing is with food... Like for me, I'd just eat schnitzels all the time. But <laughs> when, when we're in Germany and we're playing, because I'm normally night session, I won't finish till 10 o'clock, maybe half 10. Then there's nothing open, and the only thing that's open is food you shouldn't be eating. So I mean, you've got a weird relationship with food anyway, haven't you? Yeah, I don't eat before I play, so I, I go all the way through till 10 o'clock, half 10, and then... And am I right in saying you don't like chocolate? No, I hate all. chocolate. I've seen you get out of your pocket before, no. Do you want, do you want Dogs, it stinks as well. Yeah, I know. You don't even, like, if the kids have got a chocolate, you'll make them get out of the car, won't yeah, you? Yeah, the chocolate's not allowed in the car or in the house. Like, if I just sort of throw it towards you, like. I won't touch it, it just stinks. <laughs> I'm just, I just want to see what it would be like to do a podcast while also throwing chocolate. I, you can eat it, but don't. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because I'll just stop when I've got to go and wash my hands. And yeah. I'm not stinking. <laughs> yeah, I'll get rid of it. There we go. 
you, you won't get you won't get another sports podcast like that. Where you just throw chocolate at a rain in. I hate, I hate it. It's like, sometimes when I come over there, but I'll buy the kids Kinder eggs because they love the toys inside. But my boys, they'll smash it up and get the toy and remove the chocolate. So to it's be not fair, too bad. I mean, it's not a phobia, but uh, X Factor Andy Bolton scared of pencils. It's yeah, genuine, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, genuinely afraid of pencils. The weirdest phobia, and he throws <laughs> the long pointy things. Yeah. He's a dart player, afraid of pencils. Um, let's get back to the actual darts. You mentioned about you having sort of a dip back end of the year, September. The first year you were in the Premier League, didn't go well for you. I think you only won the one game. And then you didn't win for about two, three months after that. A lot of people say, oh, the Premier League, it can break players, it can break players. Do you think that's what happened? Or do you just think you weren't in great form at the time? Um, I should never play the Premier League. It was too soon for me, but... When Barry says you're you're in, you're not going to decline it, are you? So <clears throat> I was travelling a lot then. It was a new experience for me, and I think the pro tours we had 30 of them. I think I got, I got beaten 21, 22 first round matches. Managed to scrape in the players' champs 63rd or 62nd. So I should never. I wasn't ready for the Premier League. I know for a fact I wasn't. So when I got dropped, I'm just make sure to put me on that chocolate. When <laughs> when I got, when I got dropped. Um, the year after was kind of me getting right. I'm back to normal now. Then I got back in. I was like, I think actually I'm ready for it now. I've won more Europeans. I'm finally about winning. And I think when I got back in, that's when I could could have finished top. I had a chance to finish top, mm. finish second, beat Gary in the semis, and made me very first major final, which was a massive breakthrough for me then. Yeah, and that because uh, I remember you'd. you'd won a Euro Tour in Gibraltar and, and that was like your renaissance that was when you were starting to really get back into winning ways then had that brilliant Premier League campaign where admittedly Van Gogh was unreal in the yeah. final against you but that's they're the moments where again it feels like you've gone to another level did it feel like that yourself? Yeah we go back to Gibraltar I won every game 6-5 then apart from the final mm. against Mensa and then the Premier was doing that now that I got the Grand Slam semi-final off me. It was still on my CV, but it was just that was my only thing I'd ever done. Now that I finally made it to the final, I was like, I can do it if you try. I can do it. And then <clears throat> it wasn't long after. So it wasn't long after I got to the final of the was it the match player? 2018? Been the World Series of Arts Finals. Oh, that would have missed three darts. Five, wasn't it? Was it? I think it was oh, yeah, it was a 46, away. wasn't it? Yeah. And then after that, was the world final mm. against Michael. So for a year to have three, three, my best ever year, made three major finals. And I was like, I, could, I told I was like telling myself, I told you from the Premier League, you can do if you try. So I think that's where it stemmed from. Even though I was losing the finals, I was happy that I was making them. It, it only took till the Masters, I think it was, losing the match play 2019 to Rob. It bothered me a little bit. It wasn't the worst thing in the world. But losing the Masters to Peter Wright, annoyed me because then I think that's where it come from every time I lost it just got worse and worse then well that's it because you were I know all the way through those spells you'd gone Premier League final Van Gogh was almost unplayable you miss a load of darts for the title against James Wade at the World Series finals you get to the final of the Worlds again Van Gogh was very good 9-0 down to Rob Cross in that <laughs> match play final I mean you nearly you're starting to turn it round yeah. but it was just too big a hill to climb and then three match darts for the Masters. You, you're there, the titles are there to be grasped, and you're not doing yourself justice. And that has got to play on your mind, particularly when you've got people on social media going, he'll never do it, he's a bottler, he's a choker, he's the new Terry Jenkins. And whether you, th you know, obviously you disagree with that, yeah. and most people would, and you've been proven right. But it's still there and it's still niggling away at you. You can't kill the idea, can you? Yeah, it, it starts to get worse. Like I said, it all went from the Masters where it started to really annoy me. And then, what was it then? I think I had two years of not doing anything. I was still winning on the floor and stuff. And then, what was it? I made a final somewhere. I can't remember where. What was the next final after the Masters? It was it, was it the world final again? World again? final again. Yeah, well, Peter. and then last year wasn't it when you went UK Open final? Yeah. So when I lost to Peter, that was like that was like my second time here. Now I'll win it. Dog it. I was it just in my head. I was like I'll win it. I'll be fine. And I wasn't cruising the game, but I was always in command of that match until being five four up. 
he put in two ridiculous sets to put him in the lead then. So <clears throat> I didn't do nothing wrong. I know it really, that really, really hurt. And it was it was kind of a dusting off from that. <coughs> I got the call to say I was in everything again. So he kind of picked me back up. And then, yeah, Danny Nopper, Danny destroyed my career, though, losing that match in the UK Open. That bad? Yeah. yeah everybody has a bad game, though. <coughs> right? like that. No, but I, I proved when I beat uh, Gez early on, and then Keen Barry when he was playing Unreal, and then I went on a run where I didn't miss a dart. Everything just went in, I couldn't miss. And it was the same three and love against Danny. I thought, just keep doing what you're doing. You walk over this, you win 10-2, 10-3. The games went bang, just nose dived into the ground and nearly finished, man. And then, luckily enough, I had a lot of tournaments coming up where I didn't have too long to dwell on it. And then, European final, yeah, it hurt, but it didn't hurt as much because Ross played really well. And I had a chance at one twelve to level up at 9 all, I think. Or ten all, something stupid. I was like, "Yeah, come eventually." Well, it's got to come. I can't keep doing this. I also was thinking of I've already passed Terry Jenkins by this spell. I think I, I think I'm on I think I'm on seven now, so I'm level level with him. And then no, that was my eighth, wasn't it? So I like I passed him now. It's it's over. Just don't get to Peter Wright. Cause I think Peter Wright made eleven before he won his first one. So I was like, "Don't get to that, please." Luckily, love Grand Slam, Nathan just didn't show up in that final uh, to be fair I never I just took my chances I didn't play the best I could but just getting over that line I'll take any win because I've played really well and lost I played rubbish and still lost so just I, it was just about taking any win and I think mean, Nathan said it because now he's got his first he'll be he'll be hungry for more and luckily I didn't think at the time I just I'm so thankful Rich Ed always beat me in the first round of the place champs because if I would have got done well in that if not, I could have gone back to back winning the slam players. I don't think I would have won the Worlds. So going out in the first round gave me more time. Really? To get up, to get over winning the Grand Slam. Because that did, that really didn't annoy me. I was glad after a day I was chuffed that he beat me. Because I had more time to get ready for the Worlds. And I thought, I'm in a good place. I'm playing really well. Get to the Worlds and smash it. And yeah, I'm sat here as the world champion now. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to get to the world championship because obviously it's a, it's a massive <coughs> thing. It's, it's the biggest thing anybody can achieve in the game. But that Grand Slam one, after everything that had gone before, and I know that Nathan didn't perform in the final, but everything you played in that tournament, particularly the Joe Cullen, <laughs> game, I mean, you showed every quality that people accused you of not having. Um, in you know, in not winning titles, you show bottle and determination, and being able to dig in and fight, and it's stuff you'd shown all the way through your career. It's just you didn't have a trophy at the end of it. Yeah, I think that's Oracle put it up as well. Were doubles to need to stay in the match? My percentage was around about sixty percent, seventy percent. Were I didn't miss them. It was I think it was the the title winning doubles. I was rubbish at, but staying in matches and and then like Joker had the dart at seventy eight, and then a seventy two. And it was only one dart at double I was getting. I think even the last leg, I did I leave 56 or 4? There was a 6 involved. And he had 180 to leave 64, so the, the pressure was on. And I, just, I pinged it straight away, two darts. And I was, to me, I was 15, 13 down. I couldn't lose a leg. If I lost a leg, I was out. And I was at 15, 12, 15 or something. It, for me in golf, that I was one under par, though. I did two pars and a birdie, so it was perfect darts for me. That What was it like? At the end of that that tournament, to have your hands on the trophy, that, that you've done it. Yeah. You've, you've done the thing that you spent so long and got so close repeatedly to doing, and you've finally done it. What was worse when I got my hands on it? I, I looked and I was like, I put it down. I thought I could have been the two times world champion. I could have been this. I could have. That's what my thoughts initially was all that. And instead of enjoying what I'd done. I just put it to one side. I, that trophy now, I put it straight in the pub. Everyone was what I never had once had it in the house. I had the little replica. But for me, I put it down. I said, right, now it's the next one. And that's all I kept thinking. Don't dwell on that. It's the next one now. And I think that's where I could have gone back to 2011, 2012, where I thought, right, well, now I've made it now. Don't have to do anything. I finally got my major that I wanted, but it wasn't the one. It wasn't the big one. And I'm not, I, I know I can say that now after winning it, but... I just put it to one side and I was like, now we work even harder, now we get more titles, we go for the big trophy in, what was it, six weeks' time? Now we go for it and luckily enough I did. Yeah, and you did and you got it. And <laughs> I remember talking to you through that tournament 
and you were saying, I don't, I don't just want to win a World Championship. I want to win it playing the best players. I mean, there, doesn't, there isn't a better feeling, I would imagine, in darts than winning the World Championship but winning the World Championship and beating Van Gerwen in the final, particularly with the leg involved. <laughs> I mean, it's the sort of stuff, if you'd been, if 15-year-old Michael Smith was writing a things I would like to do when I am older, that's, I mean, you can't yeah. get better than that, can you? No, I've, I've, people think I'm talking rubbish when I say it, when I say it. Every round I want to play the best player because I don't want to play someone who's ranked 128 because, yes, they can play darts, but, Nine times out of ten, I know it's big headed, but I'd win. But when they play in say likes of John F. Fanger and Peter Wright, Gez, the top top boys of the sport, that's not a nine times out of ten. That's a flip of a coin who wins the game. And that's where I want to be playing them. And for me, I didn't want to play it didn't sorry. Could have been Gabba Clement, yeah, or Jimmy no, or Well, it couldn't have been Clement because I beat him in the semis. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, no, but yeah. You did play Gabriel no, Clemens, no, yeah. no, no disrespect to Dimitri. I didn't want to play him in the final. Mm. I wanted Michael, and that was for me. I know people already wrote me off. I was two and a half to one just to win it. Chris Mason said backstage, Van Gerwen's arms are going to fall off for me to win it, and it, it was just things that it's nice to hear because it's like a massive swear word back to you. Like I have got the game and doing interviews with like Iron on RTL. I, was, I don't think it's RTL anymore, isn't it? Yeah, via play. Yeah, what he the does. Dutch TV. Yeah. yeah. So doing the interview, he goes, what do you need to do to win this game? What do you, yeah, I just need to show up. I said, that's all I need to do. I don't need to do anything different. I can't tell you I'm going to play well or can't play, that I'm going to play bad. You can only do what's in front of you. And I think every round, I did enough to win. And that was all I was doing. And then when I played Michael, I saved wasn't the best game I've ever played, but in that situation, it is the best game I've ever played in that situation. And I saved it for that game. And again, it just proved. And you could see in that final, I don't think I've ever seen it before, Michael broke. Like, I literally got to him, the what the nine data, then the 130 and to make it two all in a set. You could physically see him breaking down. His doubles went to pot. It was miles away from trebles, but then it was up to me to keep like physically beating him down to where he's got nothing left and I nearly let him back in the match, nearly, because he won the set 3-0 and then he was 2-0 up in the set I managed to get back to 2 all, and then I, went, I was over for another nine the last leg to win the Worlds. That, that feeling, that feeling that you've had there where you've been winning the big titles, where even Van Gerwen, you, you said for the first time I could feel like I'm, I'm beating him into submission. Was that like a glimpse into perhaps what Van Gerwen had felt about everybody else for years. Yeah, I've, I've, I've played Michael before and just just his name, even with going back to Phil, Phil was the same. You, Phil beat you at the bull up, like just because you was playing Phil and Michael was the same, but the only thing Michael knows about me and I know about Michael, I'm not scared of him and he knows I'm not scared of him. And I think that's why we have such great games and we're such good friends because we want to play each other because I'm not scared of playing him and he's not scared of me. Do you think that you can go on to do even better things that you've already achieved i mean you've you've done it you've you've completed darts <laughs> but you know um, you yeah. could be the main man in this sport I, i'm not i'm not van gogh i'm not price or peter right i'm not going to sit here and say i'm going to smash this i'm going to win that i'll do this for me as a main target the main goal is going back to again 2010 is not to be laser. I want to compete. I want to keep practicing and keep working hard. And as long as I'm competing at a top level, I'm happy because I know I'm at the top of the game. I know I'm at the top of my game. It's about staying there. Now I've been in the top four for seven years without winning anything. Now I'm number one with winning two titles. So as long as I can keep competing and stay in that top four, I'm happy because I know eventually I'll, I'll win more things. As long as I keep focused and keep hungry. And yeah. And know the rest is history then. Michael, it's been a privilege. Really <laughs> interesting talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Show. Cheers. Thank you.